Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parker's Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. Okay, let's pray one more time, huh? Jesus, Yeshua, our beloved, I know you know, Father, that this is probably my favorite part talking about our wedding I'm asking you Holy Spirit that you would help me impart the heart that you have in this that you had in this from the beginning Lord Jesus my heart is that each one of us would fall more in love with you and have just a small glimpse of the ravished heart that you have for each one of us Holy Spirit I ask your anointing to flow Help us to understand the depths of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Okay, Okay, to this right here is to me what it's all about. Um, In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, Paul said this. Now all these things happened to them as examples, And they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And who is that? That's us. You understand that now, right? So, basically, remember yesterday we talked about how, and and this morning, there's a very strong principle in the word that pattern is prophecy. Right? Basically, God our Father gave the Jewish people their culture as a picture for us because pattern is prophecy. If you look at their Jewish feasts, they are elaborate displays of Jesus and his love for us. And if you don't know, Jesus, our Passover lamb, died exactly on Passover. If you don't understand In his first coming, Jesus fulfilled accurately to the moment. I can't remember how many it is, but it's hundreds of prophecies, maybe 800 prophecies, exactly to the moment. Do you not suppose that his second coming, because there's about twice, is it twice as many? About twice as many prophecies in the word about his second coming that there are of his first coming. Don't you suppose if he was so exact with his first, he'll be as exact with his second, which is soon. And so I'm going to tell probably one of my favorite things. I've been learning and understanding about the Jewish culture for a while, but in particular this, the wedding and the betrothal. And some of you have seen Before the Wrath. I've seen that fairly recently. Um, There's a few things in that that were a little bit different than what I had learned. But the, the main part of it is still the same. In the Jewish culture, in that time when Jesus was walking the planet, the marriages were mostly all arranged. 
Sometimes it would be um, with a yenta, a matchmaker. Remember the song in Fiddler on the Roof? Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match, buy me a fine. Right. Um, but sometimes it was just between the proposed groom and the bride's father or the father's. When there was a match made and agreed upon by the family, not the girl, but the family, they would then begin to develop a ketubah. A ketubah. Which is what we would call a bridal contract. And when the time of betrothal would come, sometimes, and I, I had always learned that he was coming to her house in before the wrath that shows them coming before the city center. But wherever it was, the groom would come with a scroll, with a glass, and a bottle of wine. He would knock on the door or be at the city center. And the proposed bride would be handed the ketubah. They would discuss the ketubah, talk about the ketubah. What's in the ketubah is everything that would be hers and that he would provide for her if she said yes. He would also have everything that would be expected of her if she said yes. He would also have the bride price, what he is willing to pay for her. She could say no, or she could say yes. Her choice. So we have a choice. We can say no to Jesus, or we could say yes. I, I keep hearing my nose, my breath, and it bugs me. So she could say no, or she could say yes. If she drinks from the cup, it is a yes. And at that moment, they are married. She, has her, she carries his name. They are married in every way. However, they do not live in the same home. He has, normally it's a year, but he has one to two years to build the wedding chamber, which is part of the father's house but also their home, which is on the father's property. Now, because it is on the father's property, it's a reflection of the father. Right? Because, you know, we look at somebody's house and we kind of, you know, make an estimate, an estimation of what the family is like because of what you see. You know, some houses you look and there's a lot of things and, you know, you make a judgment, right? We do. So if it's built on the father's property, it's a reflection of the father. So it's up to the father when the house is done. Because, you know what, if it was honestly, if it was up to the groom, he would do it really quick and probably a shoddy piece of work because he wants to bed his woman, right? I mean, you can laugh. <laughs> we know men, <laughs> right? So it's up to the father because it's a reflection of the father. And so he has, the groom has, one to two years to build this structure. During that time, while he is building the structure, she is, first of all, um, learning how to be a wife because she's probably 13 or 14, if that. Mary, they believe Mary was probably 13 or 14. Okay? And she was betrothed to Joseph. She had his name. She carried his name. So she's learning how to be a wife, learning how to be a mother, learning how to keep house. If perchance the groom was in a different um, economical state than hers, and maybe he had more money than her, then she's having to learn how to run a household. She's having to learn how to be the master of servants. But she's also having to design and make her own dress and the dress of her bridesmaids. She's a busy girl. So they're both busy because, oh yeah, the groom is coming back for the bride who has made herself ready, right? And she's wearing white linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. Okay, so that's what we are doing. 
So do you know, because we don't understand the Jewish culture so much, we've missed a lot. We really have not understood this is really all about a wedding. It is all about love. Do you know what the groom says after she's drunk the cup and they've celebrated and they are married and now he's going? Do you know what he says to her? You might have heard this before. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. So when Jesus said that to the disciples the night before he was crucified, they all understood this is wedding conversation. They knew it. Did you know that? You did. He also says, after the cup, and we're going to take communion a little bit later, and it's going to be probably, um, you're going to understand things different thing, differently maybe than you have before. When he leaves, after he drinks the cup after her, they drink it together, he says, I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it with you in my father's house. Do you remember Jesus saying that also at the Last Supper? That was also wedding talk, and they knew it. Isn't that kind of cool? So the tradition goes, waiting for the Father to say when the house is ready. Now she can see the times and the seasons. She can look and see, oh, they got the outside walls done. Oh, it's getting closer because they've got the roof on. Oh, he's starting to decorate the inside. They're putting in the windows. <gasps> you can see it's getting closer. You can know the times and the seasons. You know, in Matthew, Jesus talked a lot about knowing the times and seasons, right? So all the while, he's preparing the house. She's preparing her dress, learning how to be the wife, learning how to be the mother, making her dress... As she sees it getting closer, like Debbie had said, she has to be ready at a moment's notice. I'm not really sure why. Well, I'll get to that in a second. When the father has decided the house looks good and he likes it, he goes, son, you can go get your girl. He's all excited, of course. And he goes and get, gets what we would call... Um, the best man, but it is called the friend of the bridegroom. Does anybody remember somebody being called that in scripture? John the Baptist called himself the friend of the bridegroom. So even then, John the Baptist was referencing, oh, this is all about a wedding, because it's all been about a wedding. Jesus, do you remember Jesus one time was talking about, um, they were asking him, why do your disciples not fast? And he said, well, when the bridegroom is here, there's not going to be any fasting. He was even calling himself the bridegroom. Do you remember that? It's all about a wedding. It's all been about a wedding the whole time. So anyways, so then the son, he hears, yes, go get your girl. So he's excited. He gets the friend of the bridegroom. Then the friend of the bridegroom gets the shofar, just like we heard earlier today, blows the shofar throughout the town, and he yells out, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. So there is a shout and a trumpet and a shout and a trumpet. Have you heard that phrase before? So there's a shout and a trumpet. And as they are walking through the city, the city begins to gather. However, I'm not really sure why, but it's always usually around midnight don't know why. Do you know why? It's usually always about midnight. Remember the parable of the ten virgins? It was midnight. So then, when she hears that, she has to run out and meet this group and her bridegroom, however she is. Curlers in her hair, <laughs> night cream on her face. She, however she is, that she has to run out. That is why when she is seeing it being so close, she has to be so ready. If she's not going to sleep in her dress, she has to have it ready to throw on really fast. And she has to have her hair done and her makeup and everything. Sleep in her makeup and all that. <laughs> Maybe. 
<laughs> Maybe. So it always happens at midnight. So that is why in Scripture it tells us we should know the signs and the seasons. Do you know the signs and the seasons that we are seeing right now every day, all the time in the news? It's everywhere. Look at the war going on in Israel. Before that, who would have ever thought, and it was prophesied in Scripture, who would have ever thought that a nation could be established in a day? May 14th, 1948. And Jesus, we said it yesterday, said himself, because the fig tree always references Israel, and he said, when you see this happening, know that this generation will not pass away before you see things coming. And so that kind of depends on how long is a generation. Is it 80 years, 100 years, 120 years? If it's 80 years, we might have passed it. If it's 100 years, it's, oh my goodness, pretty close. Right? So, they have this great big huge celebration because the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, and the shofar, and the trumpet, and the shout, and the trumpet, and everybody's gathering, and the bride comes out. And then, what is so cool, they have, been, they have brought with them a litter. In the Passion Translation, it actually calls it a marriage carriage. And she gets into the litter, and she is lifted up. Does that kind of sound to like a rapture to you? She's lifted up. And then she's brought to where the ceremony is going to happen, and they go under the hoopah, and they have their marriage ceremony. Then the bride and the groom, and they go into the wedding chamber, and they consummate their marriage. And... The celebration is going on. The wedding supper is going on. And um, do you know how long the wedding celebration is? Seven days. Seven days. And how long is what we have called the tribulation? Seven years. So the wedding celebration is... Okay, I will just confess right now. There, there are many... Um, understandings and outlooks on the rapture slash tribulation, the millennial reign and all of that. I am so convinced that the pictures that God has given us in his feasts and in his celebrations, to me, it's a pre-tribulation. He's about a wedding. I don't... It, did your groom want you to go through all kind of junk right before your wedding? I don't think so. Anyways, the wedding celebration is seven days. It's not three and a half. For, do you understand what I'm saying? Some people believe there's a mid-tribulation rapture. Some people believe there's a post-tribulation or a pre-wrath rapture. But the wedding celebration is seven days. Seven days. That's a picture to me. Anyways, not a soapbox. But um, so our bridegroom told us himself at the Last Supper, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again, and I will receive you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. He said that 2,000 years ago. Very soon, I believe, he's going to hear Abba Father say, Dude, go get your girl. I do believe that very soon from now, we are going to hear a trumpet we're going to be caught away. And actually, somebody earlier today actually had a rapture dream last night. Yeah, she did. And she actually saw this. And Jesus gave her this. And they got into a white vehicle. And it spread wings and they flew away. Isn't that cool? Um... I told you about that um, book that we had studied, Longing for His Appearing. And as we were studying that book, at the beginning of the book, Derek Prince said this. I talked about it a little bit last night. The body of Christ has really become very lazy, very apathetic, especially the American body of Christ, maybe 
Um, because it has cost us nothing to say yes to Jesus. Honestly. It has cost us nothing. Do you know the church in China, who is undergoing persecution all the time, um, if you want to read a book that talks about that, not just China, um, it's called The Insanity of God. It's a great book. Um, the church in China pray for us because they know that we are weak and wimpy and will probably not make it if there's tribulation, if we are persecuted. Isn't that kind of sad that they know that about us? So Derek Prince said one of the reasons that we are that apathetic about our Christian walk, because number one, it has cost us nothing. These people, like in China, um, in, in this book, if you read it, um, he was a missionary to Somalia. If they are known to be a Christian, they will probably die. And they endanger their family. I don't know if you heard, I don't know how many years ago, it was now maybe three years ago, um, in Egypt, there were, they called themselves Coptic Christians. Did you hear about it? And the Muslims had taken them prisoner and videoed them in front of water and gave them an opportunity to deny Christ or they were going to be killed. All of them, I mean, none of them did, and they all died. Their family members, what you hear this? Their family members didn't even know where they were until they had seen them being murdered because that's what the Muslims did. Do you know what the response was of those families and that church? They wrote a letter and they said, we want to say thank you because of what you did, our fathers, our husbands, our brothers are now with Jesus. We want to say thank you because of what you did, our church had never seen such growth. We want to say thank you because you've caused us to grow closer to Christ. And we forgive you. And we hope that you would come to know Jesus as your Savior so that we could live with you in heaven forever. Wow, I know, right? What would our response be? Well, let's get out the guns, <laughs> pretty much. Saying that, do you know what our Jesus did that night we call the Last Supper? And we're going to talk about that after lunch. And you know, our Jesus knew everything, right? He knew the beginning from the end, right? He knew everything that was about to happen. And he went through all the steps of the Seder meal. There's like 12 or 15 if you count all the preparations. And out of that he chose two. We're going to talk about that later. But do you know what he did? The night he was about to be betrayed, knowing everything, knowing everything, he washed Judas's feet. I have a question for you. What has anybody ever done to you that would be worse than what Judas did to Jesus? And we like to hold that grudge. We like to hold that unforgiveness, right? Don't we? Sometimes we wear it as a banner. Look how bad they were to me. Look what they did to me. Jesus, wa Jesus washed Judas's feet. He also on that night said this. We always like to quote when Jesus, early in ministry, he said, Love the Lord my God, Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? That night, the last night before he was going to the cross and he knew he was going to the cross, do you know what he said? He said, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Not as you love yourself, because sometimes we don't love ourselves very well. 
so sometimes if we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, but we're not doing a good job because we don't love ourselves very well. But he said, love one another like I have loved you. And he washed Judas' feet. That's kind of a hard thing to sink in, isn't it? That's our beloved. That's the one who is coming soon. I want to read this in First Thessalonians. Oh, I wanted to, I, I, I keep rambling on. I forget one thing I wanted to say. My mother in love reminded me. So that book, Longing for His Appearing, talked about the reason why we are so lackadaisical in the body of Christ, especially in America, because we have made it all about me, it's all about me, and all about what I can get, and what, look what he's doing for me, which it is, but really it's all about him. You should listen to the song, Nothing Else. Um, he said, the reason why we have become so lackadaisical is because we have forgot to be longing for his appearing, recognizing that he could really come at any moment, because if we do know he could come at any moment, we would be living differently. We'd be like that bride making sure my dress is ready, making sure I can throw it on at any moment because I don't want to go with a mini dress and I don't, you know. <laughs> so if we really were longing for his appearing, we would be being about our husband's business. We would be busy listening to what Holy Spirit is telling us to do so we could be more effective. So we're not doing just the busy work, but we're being diligent doing what Father has asked us to do if we were paying attention, if we were really longing for his appearing. Something that we do, Curtis and I, we have started annually when we are looking at when the Feast of Trumpets is, and I'll tell you why that in a minute. Um, we have an annual appearing, um, longing for his appearing, anticipating his, his appearing celebration. We first called it longing, anticipating his second coming. But we're anticipating his appearing. Because his second coming and his appearing are two different things. The second coming is after the tribulation and we come and rule and reign with him during the millennial reign. His appearing is when he blows the trumpet and we are, the dead in Christ are raised. So there's, and when you're looking through scripture, sometimes people put those things together, but they're different. The appearing, the second coming, they're different. So we have an annual anticipating his appearing celebration and we worship and praise him and have food. It's a good thing to do. You might should try it out at home. Anticipate his coming. Are you anticipating his coming? And I have a question. Are you anticipating his coming because you want to get out of here? Or are you anticipating his coming because you want to be with him? When you were the bride getting ready for your wedding day, were you anticipating your wedding day because you wanted to get out of the house? Or because you wanted to be with your groom? With your husband? I have another thing to talk about for just a moment. You know, in what we call the Ten Commandments, do you know what number one is? No other gods before me. Basically, to be honest, it was a ten statement ketubah, the Ten Commandments. They were given to the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai. There was a big cloud that came over. Remember all that? And God told Moses to tell them to get ready and to be prepared because he was going to come. And they said, you know what? Moses that is too much for us. You go up the mountain, hear what God says, and come back and tell us. So basically, they said yes. They would have drank the cup. It was a yes, but it was kind of a distant yes. How many times are we just like that? Preacher, you go Saturday night up to the mountain, you hear what God tells you, and Sunday morning, come and tell me what he said. How many of us are like that? Too many. We really need to be with our beloved ourself. Anyways, so what the Jewish people celebrate every, what we call Pentecost, they call Shavuot, is a reminder every year. I know they don't see it this way, but it's a reminder to me every year that they are celebrating the anniversary of their betrothal. And they do look at it as the betrothal. They look at it as that. 
But to me, it's a reminder that they said, Moses, you go up the mountain of God, and we'll just hear what he said. So to me, it's kind of a reminder that they were going to keep their distance. And because of that, they had a habit of, um, it says in the Bible, they went a whoring after other gods all the time. You read that in the Old Testament. Moses had no trouble because he was having face-to-face encounters with God himself. They did not. He wants us to have a face-to-face encounter with him every day, all day long, so that we will have no problem having another God before him, right? Commandment number two, it says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember that one? And we kind of have a tendency, we have made it basically, um, don't say GD, right? Do you know that is such a minimal part of what that means? Do we know who Donald Trump and Melania Trump are? Do you know who, do you know who they are? Yes. yes. If Melania Trump would choose to live as a homeless beggar, she would be taking the Trump name in vain. If you have been betrothed to our beloved, if you have said yes to our beloved, You carry his name. Because remember, when she said yes, when she drank the cup, she said yes, and they were married in every way, but they just hadn't consumed the marriage. And they didn't live in the same place because he's preparing their house, and she's preparing herself, making herself ready, because that's what this is all about, making herself ready. If she, at that point, would live beneath the name of her husband, she would be taking her name in vain. That is why Joseph, when he heard that Mary was pregnant, was going to have to divorce her because she was taking his name in vain, as far as he understood in their culture at the time. Then he had the angel come. So how many have said yes to Jesus? If you haven't, you should. So if you've said yes to Jesus, you now carry his name, and you are his betrothed. Any time that we are living beneath his name, we are taking his name in vain. Anytime we are choosing to live in sin, we are taking his name in vain. Anytime we are not approaching the throne of grace boldly in the time of need, approaching the throne of grace boldly because I need a healing in my body, anytime we are choosing to accept what the world says instead of what he has said, We're taking his name in vain. I want to read this in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. And these people in in this time frame, in the New Testament time frame, the early church fathers, even though they understood that it wasn't particularly the end of the age, they still had 2,000 years to go, they knew that his coming could be at any time. And Paul said this, and, okay, I did a study in Thessalonians a while back ago, and do you know Paul was only there for three weeks? Three weeks. And Thessalonian letters has a lot to say about the times that we are living in. So in those three weeks, Paul was so involved in talking to them about the end times that they had questions about it. So that's how important he thought it was. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Okay, so Paul didn't get this from any other disciples. It was from God, from Jesus. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel. We heard this earlier from Mary. And with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. My mom's going to be there first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Because that's what he said when he left. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. Therefore, comfort one another with these things. So he has gone. He said, I go to prepare a place. And that's where he is right now. I mean, he's living in my heart. But he's preparing the place for you and for me. We need to be about our husband's business. We need to be about doing those love responses because, you know, we, we do want to have a nice dress, right? So we don't want to be 
We don't want to be doing those acts that are filled with selfish pride, self-righteousness. We want to be about the love responses because that's what we're supposed to be about, paying attention to what... We're supposed to be being about our husband's business. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so remember we read before in 1 Corinthians, we read it earlier, that all of our works are going to be tested through the fire. If they've been the wood, hay, and stubble, the straw, it's going to be burned up and it's not going to be a reward. The gold, silver, the precious stones, we're going to get re those as a reward. We will be saved, but we may not have as many rewards as we thought we were going to have because maybe our works were done because it's all about me. It's all about pride. I'm trying to gain my salvation. You know, our salvation was won by Christ. Um, I want to... We'll do the king's proposal. I want you to listen to what our king is saying. Long before I laid the foundations of the earth, before I stretched out the canopy of heaven, I was thinking of you, and I chose you to be the object of my love. Before you ever knew me, I knew you and I loved you from the first moment of your life. My love for you has existed before time itself, and it will continue when time is no more. You are worth so much to me, and all the universe which I created. You are my most treasured possession. There is none like you. I left my throne in heaven just to have you. Though I was king, I was not willing to remain as king if that meant not having you by my side. Oh, my beloved, I gave up everything to have you. I cast aside my crown and removed my robe of royalty. I became nothing more than a servant among men. Because you could not come to me, I came to you. I left heaven behind and came to earth just so I could be near you. Though I was rich, I became poor. Though I was strong, I became weak like mortal man. And I did this for you. The cost I paid was great, but I have no regrets. You are worth everything I gave. You are my darling. You are my pearl of great price. One glance from you. And I am ravished by the power of love.
don't think I came to redeem you because I pity you. No. I have done what I have done because I so greatly desire you. I did not pay the ultimate price because you are worthless. I gave it all because you are priceless. And now, I offer you a king's proposal. These are the things I will give to you, if only you will agree to become my eternal bride. I promise to take from you the heavy burdens of life and clothe you with garments of praise. Once you become mine, I will never cast you out or abandon you. You will be an orphan no more. I will never leave you or forsake you. You will have a home with me forever. And I will heal your broken heart. And my anointing will break every yoke that binds you. Instead of ashes, you will wear a beautiful garland of my grace. And I will anoint your head with the oil of health and joy. I have so many plans for you, beloved. And all of them are good. I know that sin robbed you of your beauty, but my love will restore you completely. Yes, the old things will disappear and I will make all things new for you. You will become as lovely as the moon in a procession of stars, a reflection of my love. All of your life I have been drawing you to me with cords of love. I spoke tenderly to you, calling you to come to me. Now I want to sing over you my songs of deliverance. Once you come to know how deep my love for you truly is, you will live with confidence. My love for you is perfect, and perfect love will cast out all of your fear. If you should ever lose faith in me, I will never lose faith in you. When you fail, I will be there to help you. When you fall, I will carry you. The smallest sparrow looks to me for help. Won't I care for you as well? You're worth so much more to me. Your mind will rest in perfect peace, free at last from doubt and confusion, and nothing will be able to pry you from my arms, because I will hide you in the shelter of my love. You will nestle safely beneath my wings. Those who try to harm you will answer to me, and no plan that they form against you will succeed because I will give you the keys of my kingdom. You yourself will have the authority of my name to open and close every door before you. From east to the west, from the north to the south, everything will be given into your hand. You can ask me anything, anything at all, and I will give it to you if it serves my ultimate will. Yes, go ahead and ask me, and I will even give you the nations as your inheritance. And you will rule over the powers of darkness, trampling them beneath your feet. Those who bless you, I will bless. But those who come against you shall surely fall. And I will write upon you a new name for all to see. You will be called 
the city of God, the new Jerusalem. Kings will come from the ends of the earth just to see your beauty. And they will bring their wealth to you from the far reaches of the earth. And there you will be, sitting upon my throne and wearing the crown of my everlasting favor for all the world to see. Beloved, I have prepared a place for you in my Father's house. I want you to be where I am. We will walk together in the cool of the day, strolling arm in arm in the garden of God, in paradise restored. And you will eat from the tree of life that is there. Can you trust the promises I make to you? My love, I am not a man that I should lie. I will watch over my word to perform it on your behalf. I will never change. I will always be the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, most beautiful one. My love, my dove, my beloved. If you will accept your king's proposal, all these great and precious promises will be yours. My bond is my word, and my covenant is sealed with my own blood which was given to purchase you. I will love, honor, and cherish you all the days of your life. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. This is my proposal. What will you answer? That's his proposal to you. After lunch, you're going to have an opportunity to say yes. When we take communion, you're going to understand a little bit more if when you drink the cup. And I don't want you just to drink it. Like, you know, every Sunday or every first Sunday of the month, we take communion. Oh, thank you, Jesus dying on the cross. You have to take it. I want you to be serious about it. We're going to talk about the ketubah. So as you are rehearsing your verses and everything, I also want you to be sure and ponder, am I willing to say yes? Am I willing to never take my husband's name in vain? Am I willing to be the bride who has made herself ready? Am I excited he's coming just because I want to get out of here or because I want to be with him? Maybe this could be your song to him and to be honest I have a friend who met the person who wrote this song that we've heard it sung to a girl he wrote it to Jesus you can sing it with me because you'll know it Jesus you're so beautiful to me
Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support also helps us to continue to share this message of grace, peace, and Christ's righteousness in the finished work of the cross. You can give online at cokerministries.com or you can mail your support to or prayer requests to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. You are blessed, highly favored, and so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed. Be blessed.